Okay, so I'm Peter Wolanin. I work for Acquia, do software engineering, so I work on a lot of back-end work, uh, Drupal 6, Drupal 7, uh, integration with Apache Solar, fun things like that. Um, there's my user profile. I also have a bunch of contributed modules, um, help organize our local meetups, uh, Drupal camps and things like that in New Jersey. So today, what am I going to talk about? Um, just going to give you an overview, uh, especially kind of an overview of some key concepts for Drupal 8. If you were at the previous talk, you would have gotten some of those already. I'll reiterate them. Um, show you sort of a, a bit of a side-by-side -side example of how you, uh, some code in Drupal 7 basically I converted to a plugin in Drupal 8. Um, and sort of a recurring theme that I'm coming back to in this talk is that a lot of the code is actually quite similar in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, but it's been reorganized. So it's living in a different place. It might have been relocated to a class method instead of being a standalone function, but really the underlying code is pretty similar, so uh, don't feel like it's really a new world, it's just a reorganization. Um, so then I'm going to show you uh, an example of, of a use of the plugin system that's probably going to be very common for anyone who's developing a module, which is uh, providing some tabs on a page. Um, then talk about uh, slightly more sophisticated examples of plugins, so really uh, you'll see that it doesn't require much more. Uh, so we'll talk about adding a custom block, providing a custom block for your module and providing a custom text filter. Um, and then just briefly touch on sort of a summing up and some considerations uh, if you define your own plugin system. So um, Drupal 8 background, I will sort of come back to these a little bit but really, uh, you know, I don't have time to explain them in, in depth. The, the, each of these would take, take a whole talk. Uh, but you need to know something about dependency injection, the dependency injection container. Um, I'm just going to mention it over, so if you hear me saying uh, the container, the service container, or dependency injection container, um, this is an object and basically it, it allows you to ask for a particular service. So service is kind of a stateless thing, for example it might take um, a route and generate a, a path to it. Or it might look up URL aliases, it might do any number of things in Drupal, so there's sort of uh, services that Drupal Core is providing. Um, but they're not getting data in and out. Another, another example would be the database connection. So not the data in the database, but the connection to the database would be a service. Um, the new routing system, so Drupal 8 is shifting uh, to use basically uh, code and uh, as much concepts as code brought over from Symfony. Um, and in particular we're using uh, routes that are based on names and not on system paths. So if you've use Drupal, especially Drupal 6 and 7, you know that the system path is sort of the canonical thing. There's only one representation of that. There's one page callback that corresponds to a system path. Um, in Drupal 8, uh, it's really a mapping from a machine name to a page callback and you'll see that that gives us greater flexibility. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later, but you know, as an example, we can now have two different paths or two different routes, so two different machine names, two different page callbacks for the same path. And why would you want to do that? Uh, so if you think about, for example, web services, so Drupal 8 is supposed to be a good web service platform. So for example, if you're asking for JSON content versus HTML content, you don't want to have to route that through the same code path. So now we can actually say, here's the path, like node 1, and do I want the JSON representation based on the headers or I want the HTML representation basically provide the equivalent of a different page callback depending on what kind of uh, format you want the content is in. Uh, the other thing that, that's important, um, and Drupal 8 is using this very extensively, uh, primarily for auto-loading, um, but also just to keep our cl code cleanly separated is namespace classes. So you see that uh, class names in Drupal 8 uh, can be quite long, and you saw some examples of this in the previous talk uh, if you're looking at the details. Um, but so, uh, all the name, all the classes in Drupal core uh, start with Drupal. So Drupal is sort of the vendor and then it has uh, usually the name of the module um, and then the kind of class it would be and then something more specific. So here it's the Drupal search plugin block search block. So you might have several blocks for the search module. Uh, you might have several different types of plugins so you wouldn't just have block plugins. Um, and of course you have many different modules. So at each of these levels you could have multiple things except the final uh, class name is obviously unique. Uh, within that whole long namespace. Um, and what is a plugin? So plugin, uh, this is a concept that has become very widespread in Drupal 8 but really is not new. We've seen it before um, in earlier versions of Drupal so it en encapsulates some reusable functionality. Um, and it encapsulates that in a class. So Drupal 8 plugins are really only implemented as classes. 
Um, and those classes should have an interface. Uh, so the interface is just the list of methods that you're allowed, to, you're always allowed to call and maybe some documentation about what the expected return values are. Uh, so that means that if you get an instance of a plugin implements the interface, you don't have to know exactly what class it is. You don't have to know what it's doing. All you have to know, all you know is which method you can call on it and what you expect to get back. And so that allows you to separate your code as we heard in the, in the last uh, talk. This uh, is, you know, also relates to unit testability, right? So we know we can mock uh, these plugins um, because we know what the methods that might get called are and we know what the return values might be from those methods. Um, so plugins uh, tend to combine in Drupal 7 what was uh, an info hook and then a bunch of implementation methods. Uh, so an example I worked with a bunch is the search, core search module. So the core search module, and you, if you look at Drupal 7 or Drupal 6, has a hook called hook search info. And every module that provides a search implementation returns some value from hook search info. Um, and if your module returned a value from hook search info, the search core search module knew that it could call hook search execute on your module, right? So it's on the one hand you're getting this array of information that says my module does implement this and on the other hand we have some implementation, we have search, hook search execute. But those are actually quite separated, they may not be even the same file or they might be diff different parts of the file that may not be documented as being connected together uh, within your module. Um, uh, similarly hook block info gives you the list of all the blocks your module implements, a hook block view uh, gives you the content and we'll come back to that, hook block configure, hook block save. Again, these block hooks, um, you know, especially in Drupal 7 might be scattered throughout your module file, might be scattered throughout include files. Uh, there's not necessarily a real coherence uh, that lets you isolate the code that provides one single block, right? That could be very hard to do in Drupal 7 if you think about the, f you know, your, your block hook implementations. Um, the other thing to think about is, so the plugins, as I said, we, we have had this concept before, especially using C tools or views, you know, there's this concept of C tool plugins or views plugins. It's been, you know, present, it's present in Drupal 7 and was somewhat present in Drupal 6. Um, and so conceptually this has sort of evolved from that, but the, the details of how it's done in Drupal 8 are quite a bit different um, than uh, the way the C tools did it um, in Drupal 7. Um, so one of the ways that this is different is that generally we associate with every plugin type a plugin manager um, and that is a service on this dependency injection container and basically so you can say hey dependency injection container I want to know about the search plugins um, and it will give you back uh, this manager as a service and the manager knows how to go find all the search plugins and give you an instance of any or all of the search plugins that you need. So that allows your code to be very um, agnostic about how these search plugins work. You don't have, know how to instantiate the plugins. You don't know, you don't even have to know about their dependencies. You don't have to know anything about them other than container give me the manager, container give me an instance of something corresponding to this ID uh, and now I'm going to call uh, the method on it. Um, so it, it, in some ways it makes your, the code you as a module developer write uh, quite a bit simpler because you don't have to think about uh, these other layers. Um, conceptually, so I, I just mentioned IDs, so each plugin has an ID. Um, and in general, it's written into its definition. Um, uh, plugins also have this concept of derivatives. If you use Ctools plugins, you may uh, know about plugin derivatives. So it's basically one plugin turns into many. Um, and a, a sort of uh, easy, well, well uh, an easy example to think about is a views block. Uh, I'll come back to that again. But so views isn't going to write a class for every block. Views has one block class, and then it has a lot of derivatives and each derivative corresponds to one of the blocks that you've defined in the UI. Um, so it's a way that views can basically look up data and say I don't need just the one defined in code, I also need to dynamically generate this long list of derivatives um, that are going to work exactly the same way. Um, so again, each plugin has an ID. Um, for a given plugin ID, there's a, it basically is going to map to a single class uh, that instances it, uh, with that plugin ID will use. Um, and finally, uh, for a plugin instance, uh, you not only have to instantiate the class, you may need to configure it. Um, so uh, in some cases, plugins don't have any configuration. In some cases, they're a bit ad hoc. And in, in some cases, they use a config entity. Uh, this is a concept I'll, I'll talk about uh, more. But it's basically just uh, a wrapper on uh, some Drupal 8 uh, configuration values. So. Let's look at the code. So you guys know the saying, right? So uh, 
Drupal 8, this is, uh, again, in terms of raw APIs or raw, the way the code is written looks quite a bit different, but it, they want to say it's really about organization and kind of our approach uh, to how the pieces of code interact with each other. This is a Drupal uh, 7 hook, image toolkits, which is an info hook despite not having the name info in it. Um, and it just returns you a set of arrays. Each array uh, might list one or more image toolkits. You see here the name of the toolkit is GD. Um, it has a title. And we have a function here to check if this toolkit is genuinely available. So uh, Drupal always expects uh, the GD library to be available, but PHP might be compiled without it, so we have to take that into account in this case. Um, so that's it. That's all the info hook does in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, the sort of the equivalent of the info hook is called plugin discovery. And plugin discovery is generally run through the manager. The manager has a method that finds all the plugins. Um, so here the uh, plugin manager, instead of calling uh, uh, hooks image toolkits, you would say, hey manager, give me the available toolkits. So it's very parallel. Instead of calling this info hook, you ask the manager for the list of toolkits. Um, the manager knows how to discover all the toolkits. Um, and then you can see here it actually, similar to that GD example, every plugin is providing a method to say, it, am I actually available? So again, GD might be available in terms of PHP code, but in terms of the underlying uh, PHP binary might not include that, that value. Uh, same thing with image magic. You know, you might have the image magic PHP integration code, but you wouldn't have the image magic binary on your system, so you couldn't use it. It's not actually available, even though the plugin is there. Uh, so th that makes these image plugins a little, a little odd, but you see that there's a, a direct matching, mapping between Drupal 6, you know, check if the plugin is available, Drupal 7, get the list of plugins, check it if each one is available. Um, Drupal 7, uh, we had just bare function calls. So if I want to uh, here uh, convert an image to grayscale, um, I call this image desaturate. Uh, and it would actually then use another layer of indirection to look up which image toolkit it wanted to use and then um, pass through the data to that. So you can't actually see the implementation here, but basically this image toolkit invoke is another layer of indirection and it would have to do uh, the lookup. Um, in Drupal 8, because we have the plugin we know is specifically mapping to the GD, uh, we can just put the implementation here. We actually have one less uh, layer of uh, indirection. So you see here we're actually calling out to, to the underlying uh, GD function uh, image filter. So again, the, the mapping is sort of one-to-one -one between what these class methods in Drupal 8 is doing and what your bare functions are doing in Drupal 7. Um, uh, but they're organized in a different place. And then I just want to point out at the top of the slide here, you see uh, in the comments of this class, um, it says at image toolkit, and it has an ID and a title. So we're going to come back to this more, but this is class annotation. So this is the primary method that Drupal 8 is using to discover plugins. So instead of having an info hook, we actually list uh, the equivalent information that's in that array in an annotation that's part of the comments of the class. And this annotation is parsed out, so it has to you know, meet a strict format. Um, and this at symbol means this is an annotation. And you'll see there's another at in there, which is at translation. So we have a translatable string, uh, which is the title, and we have an ID, which is GD. And if you look back at uh, what we were doing in Drupal 7, the ID was basically GD, and we were passing the title through T. Right, so instead of what was in this info hook, uh, that we were, we were, you know, calling T, we were returning an array key uh, in Drupal 8. Uh, inside the class is annotated, and when we do this discovery, we basically get the equivalent back of the info hook. There's an array of this data. So, um, what about hooks? Uh, everyone loves hooks, and, and of course they're uh, still around. Uh, Drupal 8 hasn't done away with them. Um, in the context of plugins, uh, basically every plugin manager has an alter hook. So if you uh, are implementing a module, you can actually go through and you can mess with this list of plugins that is discovered. Uh, and this is extremely powerful um, in a way that might not be obvious at first, but you can actually change the implementation of any plugin provided by core or any other module. Uh, so this is something you couldn't do uh, at all in Drupal 7, really. Um, but in Drupal 8, you know, if you don't like the way a particular search implementation works, uh, you can actually go in here and change which class is being used by a plugin in the alter hook. 
and totally swap out the implementation. And because your new class and the old class use the same interface, all the code invoking it will call the same methods um, and won't be any the wiser that you've substituted your implementation for the one that ships with core. So I, I don't think this is, is something that people have really started uh, getting their heads around yet, but Drupal 8 is going to be vastly more flexible and uh, sort of customizable if you need to in those edge cases where it doesn't work the way you need it to. Uh, don't hack core is like, you know, we've already always had that philosophy that Drupal should allow you to, you know, alter the data or manipulate the data or manipulate the code path um, rather than uh, actually hacking core. But in Drupal 8, uh, it's going to be way easier to do almost anything uh, by, you know, running one of these alter hooks and just changing an imp implementation that doesn't meet your needs. Um, so also we have, you know, plenty of hooks around. For example, there are info hooks that don't really correspond to plugins because they don't have any implementation. So a good example of that is the list of permissions. So list of permission, there is no, there's no functionality associated with each permission. It's simply a list. So that should just stay an info hook. Why would we, why would we convert that to something else? It's perfectly fine as an info hook. Um, I've talked a little bit about plugin discovery already. Um, and again, the, the discovery of plugins, uh, you can think conceptually is like invoking an info hook. Um, and that's why, you know, we have this sort of mapping of this info hook plus um, implementation in Drupal 7 to plugin discovery plus implementation in Drupal 8. Um, and you can actually implement plugin discovery as an info hook if you want to. Uh, Drupal core actually has uh, that in there. I don't think at this point it's used anywhere except in tests, uh, but that's available if, if you really uh, thought that was the best way to do it. Um, and discovery, again, is almost the same as invoking an info hook. It gives you back an array of data just some keys and values, and each of the, those keys and values is the definition for one of the plugins. It gives you an ID and it gives you some values. Um, and the discovery process may fill in some defaults, so it will fill in the provider, which is the name of the module uh, that defines the plugin, for example. Potentially other defaults uh, will be filled in uh, by the plugin manager. Um, so that's all that happens. I mean, it's very analogous, again, to if you call hook image toolkits, you'd get something. In Drupal 8, if you ask the plugin manager for the list of plugins, you get, again, basically the same thing, this array of data. Um, and there's a few different ways that uh, plugin discovery happens in Drupal 8 core. Um, so for uh, certain use cases, uh, we've adopted a YAML-based discovery, and uh, you'll hear a lot about YAML files if, as you start to work on Drupal 8. So basically anything that was an info file or some other kind of text file is going to be a YAML file, and beyond that, a lot of things that were in the database even have migrated out to YAML files. Um, so for some simple plugins that we'll come to talk to more, um, primarily these three, maybe a fourth one by the time uh, core ships, uh, will be discovered just by writing basically a YAML file into your module directory. Um, a lot of plugins are discovered through annotation, and the lists I have here are discovered through annotation, but they don't have any sort of consistent framework for configuring them. So some instances of plugins may be configured, have configuration values, some of them not. So a comparison there is between node search and user search. So node search has some configuration. Uh, you might weight uh, different factors differently. Uh, user search is a very simple implementation, doesn't have any configuration. Um, so you know, when you instantiate it, you don't give it anything. Um, finally, the most common case in Drupal core, if you start digging, you'll see is that there is a, this concept of annotation cu coupled with a config entity. Um, uh, and these are just some of the examples. And then uh, the entities in Drupal 8 are pretty much plugins, but not exactly. And like it hurts my head to even think about the ways that they're not exactly plugins. Um, but in general, if you look at them, you'll see that the entity types um, have a, a pretty substantial annotation. They're discovered using this annotation, but the way they're uh, uh, constructed is not exactly using the plugin system. So. Um, Oh, and, and caveat that some of these things still have asterisks because uh, they're like contextual links are that patch has been RTBC about 10 times and everyone keeps finding one more thing they want to fix uh, in the last uh, four weeks. And local tasks, uh, we've now converted almost everything in core to use the system I'm talking about, but uh, we're probably going to make an API change and like change the name of one or two of the keys uh, to make it a better developer experience, make them more compact and make them more intuitive. So um, those things, you know, so there's still things in progress, but let's look at uh, how we can use the Drupal 8 plugin system. 
And a prerequisite of course is that you need a module. Um, nothing works without a module in Drupal. Uh, and writing a module in Drupal 7, uh, Drupal 8 and Drupal 7 is almost equivalent for the minimum you need. You need an info file and you need a module file. In Drupal 8 the info file is a YAML file so it's .info.yaml. Otherwise you could basically uh, convert one to one your info file and replace your equal signs with colons and it would work and increase the core version to, to version 8. And then you need still at least an empty PHP file or your module won't be found by Drupal. So literally in my example module and I'll give you the link to the sandbox where you can download this group or uh, clone this example module is just an empty PHP file um, to start out with. Um, and then sort of to jump ahead, uh, I'm, I'm going to backtrack a bit. Uh, you know, so the thing I said I, I was going to tell you how to do is add tabs to a page. So this is an example of something we're doing with plugins in Drupal 8 um, using YAML discovery. So uh, within my module directory I write a file called my module local task.yaml and I put it in these two uh, just little bits of YAML data. Um, the top level key serves as the plugin ID um, and this is, you'll see here that the plugin ID and the route name are similar but plugin ID is totally arbitrary. Um, a route name will come back to you but that's how Drupal finds the content to serve uh, for this tab. Um, or actually in the case of tabs how it f figures out how to render a link to the page that serves the content. Um, uh, we have a title um, and then a root ID uh, which is basically just a, a way that we group the tabs together. Uh, so this, you see the first one basically references itself as the root ID, um, the second one references the first one um, and uh, as I said we may make some, some minor changes here but uh, these concepts uh, won't change dramatically and it's definitely going to stay a YAML file that looks basically like this. And once I've done that I can um, go to one of these pages and you'll see that I have now two tabs. Um, and unlike um, Drupal 7 I didn't have to define a quote unquote default local task. I just defined the two tabs I actually wanted. <laughs> um, the other thing you'll see that is there is no constraint on the path hierarchy between these two uh, different pages. So if you look in the menu bar there you'll see that one is config slash my module slash list. The other is config also dash my module uh, dash setting slash settings. Um, so because of this routing system where each page basically has a machine name, we are now decoupling ourselves from this path hierarchy. We're not using system paths uh, to tell us the relationship between things. Instead you saw in this YAML file we are, we're explicit um, that the second tab is grouped together with the first tab, right? We're not depending on those paths to, to infer that, that information. Um, so to me that's actually a real step ahead for people being able to understand what's going on in Drupal 7 and 6. Uh, you can blame me because I helped write some of that uh, menu code but you know once you were an expert um, you could do a lot in very few lines. If you weren't an expert like you could take a long time to understand what it meant. So the idea partly that you know I've been pushing for is to make things much more explicit and much more separated so each of these subsystems like the tabs versus the contextual links versus local actions versus menu links, these are all going to be split out and you know maybe you're going to have to spend five extra minutes you know writing an extra file uh, when you first write your module but in terms of maintaining your modules, in terms of being able to understand other people's modules, I think this will be a real step. Uh, forward for the developer experience of Drupal 8 versus uh, the last two versions. So great. So we um, have made two tabs. I've dumped out some content here which is actually just the name of the methods providing the content. Um, but we need to back up so we um, need to provide the routes. Um, and routes uh, though they're not plugins, look sort of like plugins, are also defined uh, by default through YAML files. So I can just define my module routing YAML. So in Drupal 8, hook menu is basically going to be gone by the time Drupal 8 ships. We're very close to getting it gone. And if you're defining um, how uh, a path uh, maps to a, basically a route which maps to a page callback, um, you do these in these, uh, by default in these YAML files. Um, and this is how it looks. So the two that I'm using are I define the path, uh, I tell it uh, the content, basically it's just the name of a, a method to call in a class give me the content of the page, uh, the title for the page um, and access requirements are just true. Um, so you'll see if I skip back I have a title here for these two pages, my module list, my module settings. Um, those appear at the top 
of the page, as you would expect the page title, and of course the tabs have a title defined in the tab in the local task file. So we split these things out. Now you don't have to worry that you know, the title defined for the route is, you know, how do I make that different from the title defined for the tab? Those are just you know, always completely separately defined. Um, so um, there's a few, if you're thinking about what you could put in that, that YAML file, there's a few different keys um, that are respected. Uh, the main one I showed you, you know, the route name, the title, uh, tab root ID, those are sort of going to be the three that you om almost always need. Um, you can put route parameters in. So if for some reason you wanted a tab, I don't you know, I think of a better example, but let's just say you wanted a tab linked to a specific node. You could actually list the parameters, you could list, you know, the node path, and you could list, you know, parameters, you know, node equals one basically in the parameters, and it would link to node one. Um, that specific tab would always link there. Um, so that's what route parameters are just the, the dynamic parts of the path. Um, and tab parent ID we didn't talk about, but if you have nested tabs, you have two levels. You have to tell me, of course, uh, what tab is above you. Um, weight, you know, from Drupal, uh, always a low weight, you go to the left, uh, high weight, you go to the right. Uh, options, so you could potentially add attributes like classes to, uh, specifically to your tabs if you needed to. Um, uh, class, so almost the reason that we're using YAML for these is that almost every single one of them is going to use the same class. So this default class is going to be filled in by default. Uh, it will be used for 99% of all the tabs defined in core or in defined in your modules. But if you need to do something different here, you can uh, override the class. Um, an example of that is, um, for example, a tab that links to the user account and you want to put the username on it. So how would you do that? If, if, if we had the static definition with just a static title, you couldn't ever put the name of the current user on the tab. Instead, you actually need a class they can look up the current user and return that name of the user as a tab value. So that's actually the motivation for making these things plugins is, is the sort of edge cases. So we want the simplicity of sort of a static definition and that's why we, we use the YAML files. But yet we need to preserve the ability to do a, a totally dynamic title or a totally dynamic path uh, when we, uh, you know, and we can also do derivatives. So if you want uh, a module like views that may provide many, pa many tabs uh, can actually define derivatives um, because it's using the plugin system. Okay, so that was sort of, you know, one of the simplest examples to work with in Drupal 8. Um, let's move to a slightly more uh, complicated but not much more complicated uh, example is um, blocks. So. Uh, each custom block in Drupal 8 is defined uh, in code as a class. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, in Drupal 7, if you wanted to figure out exactly which code corresponded to which block, that could be a real headache. In Drupal 8, that should be a lot easier because it's going to be encapsulated. One block, one class, you know exactly where all the code lives. Um, so when the administrator places uh, a block into a region in a theme, a configuration object is created uh, to track that, um, and I'll show you briefly what that admin screen looks like. Um, and that configuration object is a config entity. Um, and that's, if you've heard about the CMI initiative, or CMI, which is a content management initiative in Drupal 8, that's really taking a lot of things that you see in the variables table and writing them out or reading them in from these YAML files. Uh, and the goal of that is to be able to synchronize configuration, for example, uh, between development and, and production or vice versa. So if you wanted to make some configuration changes and you wanted to synchronize them in Drupal, you know, seven, that was very difficult. You might have, you have to use features and strong arm and maybe you could figure out how to put it all in code and then synchronize it. In Drupal eight, uh, it should be a lot easier to export all the configuration of your site uh, and synchronize it somewhere else. Um, so config entities are, are really just an abstraction on top of this. So uh, if you think about, um, you know, so CMI writes out YAML files, config entity is a, just lets you use entity methods basically to read and write these YAML files. So in the same way that you might load a node, you know, change a node and write it out again, you can load a config entity which is basically just reading a YAML file and manipulating its contents. Um, or it might be reading out of cache of course but, you know, just to keep conceptually simple. So Drupal now can use uh, entity functions basically to get a list of all the blocks that have been placed into regions into themes uh, because you basically using the entity API functions 
uh, to find these configuration objects that correspond to where the blocks have been placed. So this, in, in a way, there's sort of a unification of APIs that was very distinct before. Uh, so this entity API you'll see in Drupal 8 is really uh, much more widespread because it's being used for both configuration as well as user content. Um, now I'll also note, as a developer, and you'll see in the next examples, you don't have to think about this at all. If you write a custom block, a Drupal core is going to take care of reading and writing this configuration. So unless your block has custom configuration values, uh, this isn't something you have to deal with. Uh, so, but you know, just to give you a conceptual understanding of, of how this differs uh, from Drupal 7. Um, and in order to implement a block, which we'll, sh we'll go through next, uh, you're going to implement, of course, the block plugin interface. Uh, I told you at the beginning, every plugin has to have an interface so that we know what methods it can call. Um, in Drupal core, there have been a lot of uh, base classes provided, and we're going to use that. So if you use the block base class, basically every method you need in this interface is already implemented. Uh, so if you want to basically just a default block that behaves like a generic block, uh, you have to do very little work. So you just extend this block base, block base tongue twister class. Um, <laughs> um, and the one thing you will want to implement is the build method. The build method is basically the same as hook block view in Drupal 7. Um, so I did that, I added to my module, um, Drupal my module plugin block my block class. Uh, okay, so how would I do that? I mean, you're thinking, okay, I gotta add a class, easy, right? I just write the file. Um, well, it's not quite that easy, so, uh, and the reason it's not just creating a file is that you actually have to map into that namespace for the class. And Drupal currently is using a standard called PSR0, um, and it will be shifting to a standard called PSR4. These are both uh, PHP standards uh, for how to autoload classes. Um, and so one of the things that's different about Drupal 8 than Drupal 7, the Drupal 8 is using an extremely standard PHP community autoloading scheme and not the custom written autoloading scheme that we had in Drupal 7 that if it broke, broke in extremely painful ways. Um, so in Drupal uh, 8, uh, for now, if I want to create this block class, I have to create a directory uh, that corresponds with the file path corresponds to that full uh, class namespace. So I have to create a directory under modules, my module lib, Drupal, my module plugin block, and then finally I got to write my block.php. Um, and that's pretty long and it's a little annoying. I mean, you only have to do it once. Um, but once we have PSR4, that will basically cut out uh, those first two levels that are kind of redundant. And then you'll just, um, you know, you'll already be under your my module, module is my module directory, of course. And then you'll have the lib directory, which will have all your classes, and then plug in block my block. So it'll be uh, less deep because we'll just sort of assume the Drupal and your module name part of it uh, and not have to write that out explicitly every time. So that's, that's really going to be, for most modules developers, the difference is seen between PSR0 and PSR4 will just be cutting out a couple of extra levels of directory layers. Um, but, you know, this is actually a really easy system to understand. Again, every level of directory layer corresponds to a piece of the class name. So there's, you know, one-to-one -one mapping. If you see the class name, you know exactly where to find this if you went looking for it in the directory structure. Okay, so uh, this is really it. I cut out a, a couple of strange lines you, you don't need. If, if you uh, clone it, you'll see there's a little extra uh, markup declaration in this function, but otherwise this is it for my custom block. Um, so I've used annotation, again, uh, for discovery, so at block, it's a block uh, plugin, so I need to, uh, you know, if you see any, again, Drupal works by copy and pasting, if you copy and paste this, you'll get the right uh, kind of annotation. I'm an ID, uh, blocks have an administrative label, which is again translated, so I have to nest in this translation annotation. Um, and then this is really it for the class, I'm just returning a render array. Um, so my render array is two elements. Um, they're both type link, which in Drupal 8 will render as links, um, linking to uh, these named routes. And those look, might look familiar, so those are the same routes uh, that I use for my tabs. So this is a very self-contained little example. Um, so all this block does basically is render two links uh, to those two pages I showed you before with the two tabs. So uh, self-contained, you can find the pages if you want to look at them. Um, uh, so, you know, if I save that file, uh, of course, clear the cache, the Drupal finds uh, the new plugin, and then blocks them in page, I go and I want to uh, place this block. 
you know, if you start using Drupal 8, you'll see the blocks admin page has a totally new section. Um, and this is a section is called place blocks. So if you remember, of course, Drupal 7, 6, before, uh, all the blocks were listed in the center and they were either in a region or not in a region. So in Drupal 8, you have your blocks that have been placed, interactive, and then you have all those blocks again as well as any that have not yet been placed in the sidebar. Um, and this actually is one of the fantastic features of Drupal 8 I haven't heard people talking much about is that you can place the same block as many times as you want. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone is running this frustration that you wanted to, let's say, put the same block on one part of your site in one region and another part of the site in a different region. In Drupal 7, that's a really a pain in the ass. You probably have to write a custom module that redeclares the block or something. In Drupal 8, you can just say, give me a, an instance in this region, give me an instance in another region. Question, Alex? Can I use this for the ad block so I can put the ad both in the right sidebar and the left sidebar? The ad block? I don't know, just a block full of ads. <laughs> I, I have an evil scheme to make money from this feature. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you can put your ad block. Yes, you can have two different blocks of ads that are both showing the same ad if you want. <laughs> or, in fact, you can have two blocks that are the same block with different configuration. So you could have your ad, ad block in the right sidebar that showed one set of ads, configured to show one set of ads, and in the left sidebar configured to show a different set of ads. On that subject, legitimate question. Go back a slide. The ID, is that a plugin ID or is that, a con is that labels? Is that, is that configuration? Um, so this is the plugin definition that's pulled from the annotation. So that's the plugin ID, um, and then the admin label is also part of the plugin definition. Um, and that admin uh, label, so you see, is my module block, and that's what shows up in this place blocks page. Um, so really, that's sort of the minimal thing that Drupal needs to to know that this plugin exists. Um, so it has to have a unique ID. The IDs have to be unique. There's no magic about making those. Um, usually prefix them with your module name, of course. Um, and then some title here for this place box page, and then I can place one or more instances of this block uh, into regions. So um, that's a great Drupal 8 feature, and I can go ahead and do that. I click on that link, uh, it gives me the option, you know, do I want to display a title, what region do I want to put it in, and sort of the basic uh, standard block configuration because I've used you know, block base and I get get all these things for free, um, and save the block, uh, put it in the sidebar region, um, and it shows up now on my front page, and I've got two links. Uh, if I click those links, those take me to the pages with the tabs I uh, showed you before. So kind of come full circle, we're able to uh, write a block, uh, we're able to link to the routes, um, those are, that's using one type of plugin, and then where the tabs on those pages are using another type of plugin. Uh, and a little comparison here of, again, uh, Drupal 8 versus 7, a lot of it is about code reorganization, not so much even changing your code. Um, you saw I'm returning render arrays. So a lot of the render pipeline, a lot of the form API, uh, those things haven't necessarily changed. I mean, not all of Drupal 8 is different from Drupal 7, just uh, a lot of this code organization and how we um, especially organize reusable functionality like blocks. Um, so in Drupal 7, we would have called, you know, hook block info. We now uh, get the definitions of the plugins for the manager. Uh, hook block view, and you had to tell it about a delta, right? Because you could have had multiple block implementations together in one function in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, they're, they're isolated to one class, so you only, have to, you only have the build method on the class returns the render array for that one block. Um, Drupal 8 has an access method in the interface, so if you want to provide some unique and different access control to your blocks, you can do that. In Drupal 7, you probably would have had to hack that into the view method. Uh, Drupal 8 uh, basically has uh, form, validate, and submit methods. Uh, again, you don't need the delta, and they behave a lot more like standard form API functions. They get the form and the form state. Uh, in Drupal 7, you got the delta, and then you didn't have a validate, and then you saved, and you got the edit array which was something from like Drupal 3. Um, <laughs> so quite literally. Um, so, you know, this is all sort of more modernized and it yeah, works actually in a quite more standard way in terms of form handling. So hopefully things like the block API are now a lot more understandable to someone coming from it who understands something else about using Drupal forms. Um, 
So, um, block discovery, I've talked a little bit about annotations like the at block annotation. Um, so each um, plugin uh, type obviously needs to be located in the right namespace. So the discovery when you're using annotations is looking for uh, plugins within a certain namespace. So under, under your module, it should be located in a certain directory. Um, and then most core plugin types, actually probably all by now, have a custom annotation class. So that at block is, if you look, you'll see it's actually an annotation class. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And that annotation class provides some documentation in this case around what the allowed uh, keys are in that plugin annotation and what the default values are. Uh, for uh, local tasks I showed you, that was sort of stuck into the manager because we didn't have uh, something else. So the manager had to provide the defaults uh, for blocks. The annotation class provides the defaults. Uh, there is also a generic uh, plugin annotation class. Um, you may be able to use that as a starting point. Uh, generally, you'll want to extend it and provide your own custom annotation uh, if you're defining your own plugin. Um, this is what the blo block plugin annotation looks like. Uh, it's actually extremely simple, only has those two keys that I showed you I used, which is the ID and the admin label. Uh, but this gives you uh, some documentation about what, what the allowed values are. And for other plugins, you'll see that they can also provide default values. Um, so because this is a class, I instantiate it uh, when I'm processing that list of blocks. Um, and so therefore, the variables, if they have a default value assigned, will get the default value assigned into your plugin definition. Okay, so let's look at another example of a, a Drupal 8 core plugin, which is um, uh, creating a text filter. So I don't know how many of you have done this uh, before. Few, okay. So, great. Um, you know, this is, can be really handy if you want to uh, do some custom transformation of your text, a certain, you know, unique uh, custom set of tags or custom set of markup into something. Um, it's used for modules like a media module, right, to transform some kind of specialized markup into actually an embedded image. Um, it's used, you know, obviously if you want to do something like Markdown. So the example I took here is basically from the Drupal 7 version of the project module. And you know if you use Drupal.org and you put an issue number in brackets with a percent sign, it'll make a link to the issue with the title. So I wanted to just do a simple version of that and show you how you can implement a simple version of that in Drupal 8. Um, in Drupal 7, uh, text filters uh, have an info hook. Uh, so this is an info hook to plug in kind of conversion in Drupal 8. Uh, they're keyed by some unique ID, uh, they have title description, um, and then a set of callbacks. Um, and the implementation for those callbacks could be somewhere, uh, anywhere in your module file, um, anywhere in an include file, you don't know. Uh, in Drupal 8, uh, we're going to group these things together. So the annotation is right there on the class, so sort of the equivalent of the info hook is together, right, co-located in the same file with all the implementation. Um, here it's an at filter plugin. Uh, has a uh, similar kind of ID. Uh, if filters at this point want you to tell you explicitly what module is providing them, uh, give it a title with the translation um, and give it some information about what type of filter it is, uh, what sort of transformation it's doing. Um, and you'll see here that um, instead of having separated callbacks, I basically have to just implement, I've extended this base class, filter base which means I'm sort of alleviated from responsibility of implementing anything I don't uh, need. It's already implemented for me. Uh, and then within uh, that, it has a couple uh, functions that I'm going to use. So I'm going to have a process function, uh, which basically just looks through the text and it's going to perform a regular expression, look for a match, um, and then it's going to do a callback. I haven't uh, shown you the callback here, but if you clone the Git repo, you can see the content of it. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, basically copy it again from this Drupal 7 project module. Um, and then we have filter tips. So filter tips are also built in here to the class. And the filter tips are just going to tell me uh, what this filter does if I enable it. So again, uh, the code looks, I really just copy and pasted most of the code from the Drupal 7 project module into this class. So it's about code organization, not really about uh, what the code is doing. Um, and so to see it working, if I just, you know, post my first node, uh, something dumb at node one. Um, now I go through and I configure this text filter. Um, so I'm in my basic HTML, uh, click configure. Um, now I can enable uh, this formatted node ID as a link. So that was, uh, 
that was back here in the annotation. Format a node ID as a link. That's the title. That shows up uh, right here uh, with a checkbox. Uh, so I enabled it. Now I'm going to go and look at my node 2 and I want to link node 2 back to node 1, uh, tell you about it. Uh, so in node 2's body I can just put these brackets, percent 1, which is the first node ID. Uh, you'll see that my filter tip is showing up at the bottom. Um, and if I save this, uh, I basically run that regular expression, I find the matching pattern, I do the replacement with a title and link back to the first node. So again, you have plugins, it's about your discovery, how do I find the plugin? Uh, that's, you know, conceptually similar to an info hook, but with these annotations, I'm putting the, all the information needed to discover the plugin in the same file uh, with the plugin itself. All the implementation for the plugin is in that one file and that one class. Um, so it keeps it together, it's very, it's going to be a lot easier for you to potentially copy and paste those and modify them, because uh, you don't have to go uh, looking around for where the implementation lives. Um, and um, as you uh, start thinking about upgrading your modules to Drupal 8, um, you might be thinking, well, okay, that's great to implement, it wasn't that hard to implement, but how do I define a custom plugin type? Um, so, if you're creating your own plugin type in Drupal 8, so for example, you, your module defined an info hook or your module defined a ctools plugin type, uh, you're, you're going to need to figure out how to expose a Drupal 8 plugin. Um, uh, this annotation based discovery I've been talking about should really be the default, uh, so that's uh, the standard use case uh, because it keeps the metadata together with the class. So in that one class file you see the annotation, the annotation gives you the definition of the plugin and inside the body of the class gives you the implementation of the plugin. Um, the only case we're using these YAML discovery at this point is for, as I said, cases where 99% of the time the class is the same, the implementation is the same. So it was really um, kind of annoying to have to keep writing classes that were all empty and all extended the same base class. Um, and instead we could have a file that just listed out as many of these as you needed. Because uh, again, they're using, basically all using the same implementation. So this is sort of an extreme case where you might want to use this YAML. It's unlikely that would be what you're doing. So most often you're going to want to probably use this annotation based uh, discovery uh, if you define your own plugin. So um, just to start wrapping up, uh, so there's some links here. Uh, we'll figure out how to post the PDF for this online so you can uh, come back to uh, review it or uh, get these links. I uh, have in a sandbox uh, all the module code that I showed here, complete. You can uh, download it, put it with Drupal 8 core, turn it on and uh, see it working. Uh, it doesn't do much but it's a starting point. Um, uh, there's already a handbook page on converting Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 modules. Uh, of course all handbook pages you know as a Drupal.org member you can edit. So if you're interested in starting to upgrade your modules to Drupal 8, uh, it's you know, sort of on the cusp of when you would start thinking about doing that, you probably still have to do some refactoring over the next few months, but it might be a good, good time to start thinking about it. As you do that, please do contribute to the documentation. Um, there's also a handbook section on the plugin API in Drupal 8, which goes into a lot more depth in some of these topics and also some of the motivation for why uh, these systems were chosen uh, to work the way they, they do. Um, and then there's a nice blog post. Um, uh, that covers a lot of the same material but just from a different perspective. Uh, so you might uh, take a look at that. Um, so uh, again, working and wrapping up, I just want to talk again about some of the great features that Drupal 8 has uh, that I think people are not, not yet aware of uh, sort of how, how exciting it's going to be. And um, the use of interfaces in Drupal 8 is, is really uh, going to change the game in a lot of ways because as I said you can substitute your implementation uh, your implementation of a plugin, your implementation of a service, um, many different places in Drupal, you'll be able to much more easily uh, replace what Drupal is doing with your custom version. Um, and it's because of this use of interfaces that means we have a very well defined set of methods that can be called and set of return values and as long as you adhere to that contract, uh, your code will work together with Drupal. Um, uh, sort of minor feature, it's, uh, for things like tabs, it's a lot easier now to place them regardless of hierarchy, um, regardless of their path. Uh, so the hierarchy is sort of explicitly defined um, and not path based. Um, that becomes as a consequence of the fact that we're using route names. So these unique machine names that map to a page callback. Um, 
these, uh, this using a machine name to map to a page callback gives this great feature of having multiple of these routes match a single path. Uh, so again, we can uh, deliver different content based on what the user is requesting. So if you request HTML versus JSON, or if you make a get request versus a post request, we can actually route that to a different callback. Um, I uh, mentioned the config system, so everything that was in the variables table in Drupal uh, 7 has basically been split. Most of it is now config, so it's in YAML files that you can basically deploy uh, between different sites. Uh, there's uh, some that's also in a system called state, and state is th for th the small subset of things that you don't want to deploy. So for example, the timestamp at which cron last ran is not a value that you would ever deploy from dev to production. I mean, you know. No, <laughs> just don't do it. But you know, uh, things like um, you know, which search implementations are enabled is a configuration that you might well uh, want to change and deploy between your sites. Um, uh, YAML has really a, a become the standard format for data files for Drupal 8. So if you look around Drupal 8, uh, you'll see you know, the routing files, these uh, local tasks files, local actions, uh, contextual links should be there, some other things. Uh, all the config, of course, um, uh, are all written out as YAML files, so you should get familiar with that format if you're not already. And then, as I said, that the great feature that you can have multiple instances of the same block and place them in different regions and potentially uh, configure them differently, have different page visibility, um, but allows a lot more flexible use of blocks. They're kind of a, a much more important kind of content in Drupal 8 than, than in Drupal 7. So. Um, this kind of sums it up. Um, I think I will not read through these because uh, you've heard it all, but uh, why don't I stop there and you can read them or ask me questions. Thank you.